welcome to the How to Create Your Own Novel Panel 2020 Virtual Comic Con. I'm Brianna Winter, and I'll always be on this side. And I'm Brittany Winter, and I'll always be on this side. And everyone else is a singleton, so they don't need to specify which side they'll be on, which makes things easier. But we're very excited to see you via the internet, and we hope you're all, you all are all very safe and healthy during this difficult time. Uh, we are incredibly honored to have uh, three amazing guests with us that are also like our family. So this is kind of a family panel. <laughs> so we have Todd McCaffrey, Rebecca Muesta, Hi. and Kevin Anderson, or Kevin J. Anderson. Kevin J. And Yeti, the cat behind me, he's insisting on being part of Comic-Con today. Oh, so. yay! Our most special furry guest. Yeah, we decided to keep Britt's guide dog and her 10-week-old puppy in the other room. Otherwise, this would be a zoo. <laughs> so the origin of this panel is, uh, what well, over a decade ago, Britt and I went to our first Comic-Con. We were little kids at the time with a manuscript and a dream and no idea what to do. And we really wished there was a resource that could tell us briefly a little bit about each step of the publishing process. So we decided after being able to achieve our dream and publish a book and have our own booth and panel at Comic-Con to try to share with everybody what we wished we knew. And this is that panel for our, what, eighth year in a row? 10? No, no, 10? Yeah. Oh my, this is our t I think it might be our 10th year. Is that our 10th year? Well, we've lost track. It we've lost track. Matter. So uh, it, it's gonna be really broad uh, and just our first question uh, is gonna be how you got started. So we're gonna ask each of our guests, what's your origin story? So who we can start with? We're gonna start with, uh, let's start with Todd. Todd. Hi. Hi, I'm Todd McCaffrey. Uh, my origin story is kind of weird. I started reading science fiction way back when uh, and fell in love with Space Cat and Space Cat on Mars. Uh, but discovered slightly after that that I actually had a mother who was a writer uh, and she allowed me to earn my first typewriter by learning how to touch type. Um, yeah, when you have a real famous mother, it becomes a little bit more difficult actually to get started because you've got this huge looming shadow. Uh, and it wasn't until 1984 that I was dragooned into actually writing something. And then after that, I just didn't stop. All right, uh, Rebecca. What is your origin story? Origin story. Um, I wanted to be a writer since I was a teenager. And I would practice by telling stories to the kids that I babysat and to my friends and uh, reading novels out loud to anybody who would listen to me. I thought it was good practice. And um, I would start stories, writing stories. And then I'd, I, I'm very ADD. You may figure that out during the course of this. And I would get distracted and then kind of forget about my story. And then I'd get a great brainstorm of an idea and I'd start something else. Well, I never finished anything. Um, fast forward many years. And um, I was the president of a book club at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And we invited the great author, Kevin J. Anderson, to speak to our group. And um, he came and I had thought he was probably in his 50s because I had read his first book and I thought it was very mature. And then he showed up and he's this snot nosed kid. Um, he's five years younger than me and he was published and I was kind of infuriated, but he actually gave me the secret uh, that he started finishing things. Um, which was how he was so far ahead of me because I never finished anything. But the other secret was I got to know him and a bunch of other authors and watching how they became successful helped me to succeed. That's awesome. I actually, I actually didn't know that. And I also have ADD and have a lot of unfinished ideas. So I understand. Well, yeah, squirrel. <laughs> See, everyone makes, Britt makes fun of me all the time. She goes, yeah, squirrel. She's Doug from Up. You know, there are worse characters to be compared to. He's a good dog. <laughs> Kevin, what is your origin story? 
Well, I think Rebecca's impressed with me now because I actually am older than 50, but um, I've finally met her expectations after all of this. Um, I, I decided I want to be a writer when I was five years old, when I saw the movie, The War of the Worlds. I was this little kid and I just watched that movie and it just blew me away. And I thought, I want to tell stories like that. And I had a real handicap at the time because I was five years old and I didn't know how to write. So that was one big hurdle that I had to uh, overcome is learn how to write. But I started like making up stories and drawing pictures and telling them out loud. And uh, by the time I was 10 years old, I had saved up my allowance so that I could spend all of my money to buy my very own typewriter. Uh, now, see, we've all mentioned typewriters so far. It's parallel here. Yeah. Well, but I, I think we should actually talk to some of our Comic-Con audience and, and explain to them that um, a, a typewriter is kind of like a laptop, only it's a lot more old fashioned. Um, it's, oh my God. I mean, people don't, it's like talking to people about, uh, you know, record albums or something like that. Right, um, they're cool. But, but I, I think when I was 12 years old, my parents got me a subscription to Writer's Digest magazine when, for Christmas. And, and I just started sending stories around and getting rejection slips. And, and I mean, these were in the days where you had to um, type them up and then you had to either use a carbon paper uh, to make your own copy of it, or you had to go uh, and, and make an expensive photocopy on, on stinky chemical paper and, um, I mean, this this is far beyond the experience, and that's the problem with when you get a bunch of old established authors to tell their origin stories. It's so far beyond what most people are going through today that they might not um, relate to a lot of it. But uh, I've since I, I started. I published my first novel when I was 25, and then I sold a bunch more novels. And then Lucasfilm asked me to write Star Wars novels, uh, and then I worked for the X Files. I worked for DC Comics and and Marvel Comics and Dark Horse and then I started working with uh, Brian Herbert to do uh, Dune novels, uh, and I've got a bunch of other uh, series of my own. And one of the fun things, just we tie back full circle all the way back down to, uh, to Todd, when I'm working with uh, Frank, uh, Frank Herbert's son, Brian, to do these Dune novels, we're digging through all of Frank Herbert's boxes of papers and correspondence and looking at, at all kinds of things. And I found, I think it was from 1964, a fan letter that Todd's mom wrote to Frank okay. Herbert Whoa. about how much she liked Dune. And I'm pulling it, and I, and I pulled it out of the box and I read it and I just kind of did a double take. I went, are you kidding me? And this was like right before she had written Where Search. Oh, wow. And it was just, it's buried That's in a box somewhere, but but I guarantee you, I know it exists. So, um, so but that, to get back to what Rebecca's saying, we've known Todd for ages and, and, we go to Comic-Con every year and we always, well, not this year, uh, but when we go, we meet other authors, we meet other editors, we meet other comics publishers, and it's knowing so many people is how we kind of make our connections. That's how I get a lot of jobs. I mean, I've, I've asked Todd probably three or four different anthologies, write me a story for this. Um, that's just yeah. how, how writers kind of um, network and they get, get additional work, so. Um, maybe and that if leads you into don't another. know how to do something, you call your friend that's done it before and say, hey, how did you manage to do this? Oh. Right. And uh, the beauty of today is that even if uh, just uh, even because of COVID and everything and we're all kind of stuck in our homes, we have social media, we have the Internet, we still have the ability to make connections and ask and make friends. Yeah. And we didn't even have that. I mean, we. There was the internet, but there was not the ebooks and what there is now. And we got started 12 years ago. Yeah. So actually 12 and a half years ago. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. The world is becoming sci-fi, or at least it feels that way. Was it 13 years ago? No. Yes? Yeah, yes, it was 13, it was 13 years ago. Yeah, because we ago. started at 12. Yeah, 13, 13 years ago. You notice the ones reminiscing about how long ago it was are the two kids who were on the panel. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. we're, yeah, we're, we're, that's pretty much, we feel like it's a lifetime. Oh, 13 years. Oh, my. We're so old. Well, I can't believe that time was around back then. Yeah. 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 Remember yeah. when there was iPods? Yeah, we're punk kids, as our dad calls us. Our dad says, you're punk kids. You don't know nothing about nothing. And we're like, <laughs> yep. yeah, that's true. We know a little about books, though. But besides that, eh. Yep. So I think it's, is it our turn? It is our turn. So uh, our origin story, yeah. Uh, so, you want to start? <laughs> yeah, we, did a, we had a twin moment. You want to start? I'll start. Okay. Uh, so we started writing our first book at 11 and a half to overcome our learning disabilities. 
Um, and I didn't know I was actually um, visually impaired at the time. So I was partially, I couldn't see one image. I saw two, two images and they were moving and it was dark and I didn't know because when you're born that way, you, you think that's normal. Everyone can see that way. So uh, in fourth grade in the California uh, school system, they double the amount of work and uh, we thought we were very stupid. Oh yeah, we were convinced we were the most stupid twins on the history, so uh, was, in the history of humanity. It was our dad's basic a dare for us to write a book, and it's something that we had already, we loved creating stories, mm -hmm. uh, and we wrote our first book um, through a very old dragon speak um, that took forever to use, so it took, a, took us nine months to do, and uh, we took that manuscript to Comic-Con, and at Comic-Con, we started to talk to people, and Really, no one took us seriously, but a lot of people were really sweet. Very I nice. I didn't understand why people didn't see me, a 12-year-old, and realize I was a sophisticated author. I look back now, I understand. Yeah, we looked like we were nine. Yeah, even though, even if we looked 12, right? Yep. Yeah. So uh, we actually sent our book in for independent awards and ended up winning uh, eight. And from there, that's how we got recognized and went into Borders and Barnes & Noble on our 13th birthday. They I actually were very nice. They timed it on our birthday. Because then we were, we were turning 13. So they wanted yeah. to give us a gift. Like yeah. a gift. For, for, they were, I miss borders. So I say actually where we really networked and how we build our career was through the conventions. Um, but even now um, online, you can really do that online. I, I realized, I don't know how many years ago it was, I, I came to Britain and I said, hey, Brit, social media is, is pretty much just one big Comic-Con. You could just go up and talk to anybody. Doesn't necessarily mean they'll respond, but yeah, you could try. You can do a lot more now with all of the different websites. And, and now with, with Amazon, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, with publishing. So uh, let's go off to our, our second question, which is uh, we want to know more about each of your writing processes. Yeah, I think at least for me, learning about uh, other authors, especially those who I admire, their writing processes really helped me um, learn how to start my own. And uh, throughout my career, I think the thing I found one of the most powerful tools is that I continuously ask and read about uh, beginner's advice. So I go and I read about everyone's processes, everyone's advice, and try to keep kind of a, a beginner's mind. So why don't we start with the opposite, what we did last time. So why don't we start with uh, Kevin? Kevin. We well, I have, I have an unorthodox writing method, and, and I get asked so often about it that I actually wrote a book about it to get people to be quiet. But uh, I, I do all my writing by dictating. Um, I, we live in Colorado. I love to hike. I love to walk around bike paths and climb mountains and go around uh, waterfalls and things. And so I, I outline my books. I'm a, I'm a very careful outliner. I'm not a pantser. I'm a careful outliner. And I have a digital recorder. And I will go out for a walk and kind of get into this this zone where my my head is entirely in the story. My dialogue is I'm I'm role playing the characters that I'm writing about, and I have my notes for chapter one, chapter two, or whatever it is. And I'll just go for a walk. I I have done uh, as much. I think my most ever was like twenty thousand words a day that I dictated. Uh, that's that's unusual. My average is like four thousand or five thousand words a day. That's got I'll, just, I'll just go out. And I'll dictate probably two chapters. I get up in the morning and I just go out and walk and I do one chapter and then I turn around and I walk back and that's enough time to do a second chapter. And uh, then I get home and I send the audio files off to a typist who transcribes it. And then I get a word file back and I edit it. Uh, the editing is the hard part. The creating, the writing, the first draft is the fun part. And um, I, wrote, I wrote a book called On Being a Dictator because so many people ask me, well, how do you do that? Uh, one, one real key thing that I talk about it is I've had many people say, oh, that sounds like a great idea, but I tried it for one minute and 23 seconds and it didn't work for me, so I stopped. And, you know, dictating is a learned skill just the way typing is. I mean, you didn't sit down at a keyboard the first time and type 100 words a minute. You have to learn how to process that way. But to me, it means I can go out hiking all day long and say I'm at the office and I just you know, that's the, that's the best way for me. Uh, my audiobook readers, the narrators tell me that my books are some of the easiest ones for them to narrate because I'm dictating my sentences. So I don't say any sentence that no human mouth could ever speak. Whereas if you're typing it, you don't really know how it sounds out loud. Mm -hmm. And so that's really, really helped me, but it, it's really increased my speed. I love 
going out walking, especially it's, it's summertime now, it's beautiful weather in the mountains and I go out and get lots of stuff done. Um, but then when it comes back, then the hard part is that I have to go over it and, and polish it up a little bit. So that's my technique. I'm gonna try that. That's great. Yeah, and yeah. it's funny, Britt and I actually read everything to each other. So oh. but we'll mention that when it's, when it's our turn. Rebecca, your turn. We want to know more about your writing process. Um, the, I wasn't sure what the question meant. Um, oh. so I was thinking about my process. I, I do outline. I've never done a book or a story yet that I haven't outlined. But I also like to spend time making up the characters and getting to know them and giving them backgrounds and stuff. And then once I start writing, and I dictate also, but because I've had multiple arm surgeries, I had to uh, dictate. I had to learn to dictate. And as Kevin said, I thought it wasn't for me when I first tried it. And then after my arm surgeries, uh, the doctor said I couldn't spend as much time on a computer. So uh, it took me about a week to learn how to dictate. Not that bad. I do it completely differently from Kevin. I actually make up a whole sentence in my head and then I'll speak it. I'll stop the recorder and I'll make up the next sentence. He just speaks it like he's sitting around a campfire telling a story. Mm -hmm. um, so you can do it different ways. When we first started the technique, we would just go out on walks and brainstorm stuff. And we, um, we would just take notes and record the brainstorming. So that was the first. And then it progressed to where Kevin was doing all dictating. Mm -hmm. But um, part of my process that was getting to know the characters can be sometimes time wasting because I discover in the writing of the book that I actually have to change a lot of the characteristics to match what they're doing because, or um, the backgrounds don't really go with their personalities and, and I have to kind of change it, but I had it too. That, that's cool. Uh, we, we don't really talk, Britt and I started out dictating and we don't, we haven't really over the years talked to a lot of other dictators. It's, it's different though. I, I really like that we've talked about this on this panel because I don't think we've had any other dictators besides me on our panels before. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I think it's a really good way to write, especially for a lot of um, Bran and I and Todd actually, we teach classes to people that are also blind and visually impaired. I don't, so. I don't think you've told anyone that you're blind. Oh, yeah. So uh, for those who don't know, um, I went blind a, a few years ago and Brianna is sighted. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that later. But uh, it, I think dictating is a really powerful way to be able to write. And I, I think that it's, it's not as, um, I met a lot of people that didn't think it was actually writing. Like they're like, oh, I dictate, but that's not writing. No, it's, it's writing. It's like listening to an audio book and people are like, well, that's not reading, but it is reading. Well, well anyway, I, I, I love that. And I, I like, cause I do, I do something like similar to what both of you guys do. Uh, I, I think that it's a really good way to overcome writer's block as well. Mm -hmm. uh, when people get stuck. Anyway, uh, Todd, I, I digress. Todd, 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 Todd. Todd. Hi. Rick, quiet. Um, wow. So I have tried many different ways. I occasionally outline. Um, nowadays I'm doing a lot of pantsing. My mother used to have the same thing. As a matter of fact, the, the twins teach a method that's kind of similar to this, which is where you imagine how you want the story to end and you head in that direction. Uh, and so a lot of my pantsing is, is somewhere in there. I've also done stories where I start with a character and I go, hmm, what would this character do? I had a, a, a fun story where I said, well, how do, you, how do the meek inherit the earth? And I proceeded to write a story where it paid to be meek. Uh, when you're married to a fire-breathing dragon who has temper management issues. Uh, and so that's what I've done. But, but usually when I get something really big, uh, I have to go back and spend some time working on the outline. Uh, my, my huge AI novel, LA, uh, I actually went back and tore that book apart nine different times, looking at it from nine different character points of view and then reassembled it. Uh, but th that's an undertaking that I don't, don't often do. Uh, I have a lot more fun when I can just start off and go to the end and be surprised along the way. And, and I have a lot of fun with that. 
And that's kind of my technique, although my technique seeing this when I work with the twins is kind of different because again, with Brit being blind, you have to read it to her. And you discover when you read things out loud, what doesn't work. You discover uh, that there's better ways of saying it and you, you get a better word flow. It's kind of like almost like reading it loud. Sorry, Todd. What? Sorry for interrupting you. Uh, I was going to say, I recommend reading aloud your stories whenever you can. Agreed. Yes. Uh, it's, it's almost like rewriting while you're writing. And that's kind of something that we've done um, over, I think it's our term. Yeah. So we started out purely dictating and then editing uh, after. Uh, but we relied a lot more on an editor when we first started because we're both dyslexic. And now, now, uh, when you're, so dyslexia always plagued me my whole life. And I thought it was my biggest problem that I had to overcome. But when you go blind, it really doesn't matter anymore because you can't see. So uh, now everything <laughs> doesn't really matter. I, so I, I take that same dictation um, to writing that I do now. But uh, I actually use a few programs. Uh, I use something called Zoom Text, um, which makes everything bigger. And then something um, called JAWS, which reads everything on my screen. Uh, and then I also use Dragon Speak. So because I can't see, I need something to, um, so text to speech, speech to a speech to text, and then a, uh, a screen reader, because I never, I can't read it. Uh, and I've, been, I've actually been taking classes on how to be able to combine all of those technologies in one. Uh, but I'd say for someone that has, say, a weakness in typing, uh, speech to text is a great way to get started. Um, and someone who doesn't like to read, but I want to read their story back, a text to speech. Um, you could do all that with an Apple device. I think most Androids, but Apple and iPad. Um, and now it's free. And now it's free. And Apple, free. Apple basically do all that for you right now. And uh, so that's how I write. I write with Brianna um, using those new technologies or on my iPad. I just dictate and have it read it back to me. For me, I, over the last, seven years, I gradually stopped using dictation because my strength is uh, visual, uh, kind of visual memory, visual comprehension. And we both plan out our books kind of starting with an end visual. We write that end visual down in our notes and then we kind of reverse engineer the story from the end to the beginning and in the middle, kind of the way we, we kind of reverse engineer the, the summary. And then we write it from the beginning to the end. However, I'm starting to change my method and I'm trying to, I'm going to start dictation again. Kind of being inspired by Britt, and by Kevin and Rebecca. And I think you'd be good at it. Yeah, because I've been, I've been, you know, writer's block, everyone goes through it. It goes through it. I got a, a weird case of it that's been on and off for a few months. I think that's pretty normal. It's COVID. A lot of people are having a hard time writing. So I'm thinking about trying something new and different well maybe not so new i that's how i started but going back to the beginning yeah i think layout laying things out um that's where we start i think just to talk about that we, we started out pantsing though yeah we started out just coming up with stuff but now we do layout and there's plenty of books and the more um we talked about this earlier the more that you read uh, like reading kevin's book on dictating uh, we, we read um stephen book stephen king's book on how to write um, there's, what's the other, the writer's journey is the other one that you read. We yeah. have a couple books on writing just as much as you can get in to, in, and to realize that when you start writing, there is no one way to do it. There's just because you admire an author, you don't have to be that author. You just need to be the best that you can be. Mm -hmm. So finding the right way that works for you, even if it's unorthodox is just fine. Uh, so, uh, next question, our next question, our next topic would be on editing. And also, I think at this point, we usually get people ask us about writer's block, because I know a lot of people hit writer's block, particularly if the first time they ever have uh, gotten to rewriting or editing. So I guess our, our, our question would be, oh my God, how much time do we have? Oh, yeah. How much time do we have? I think it's, we, we've been on, what, 20 minutes? We've been on 20 minutes. So we yeah, have 20 minutes. I think yeah. we're about the halfway point. Yep, the halfway sure. point. So let's talk about um, public. Well, public let's, let's, yeah. let's, let's, let's do a little bit of do it. Yeah, okay. And then we'll let you, I'll let you do the other one. Deal? Yeah. See, it won't be, it won't be a twin fight, even though that would make for a way more entertaining panel. All right, that, go that's Ruby. true. Uh, so I think the question would be, uh, how do you overcome writer's block? And also any advice on editing and rewriting if it's fairly broad? Uh, can we start with, can we start with Todd last time? Do we want to start with? 
We're starting with Rebecca. Oh, start with Rebecca. <laughs> Anarchy. Anarchy. Ooh, okay. Um, I think um, one of the important things for me um, uh, that was blocking me was trying to edit at the same time as I was writing. And when I was doing it on screen, I was constantly rewriting, rewriting, rewriting. And so the dictating kind of made forward the only direction I could go. And then the advice that Kevin and uh, uh, Christine Catherine Roche and uh, Dean Wesley Smith give is dare to be bad, go back and fix it later, get it finished, and then fix it afterwards. And if you're trying to fix it while you're in the middle of it, it can kind of create its own writer's block. So that's one of the most helpful techniques. It's funny because that's exactly what I was going to say. And uh, Todd, what is, uh, what is your insight? Well, up until recently, I would have said uh, writer's block was, was probably more imagined than real. But I got to say this coronavirus has sort of slowed me down a lot. Um, I think, uh, I don't know how many people here, I, I actually imagine you all are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yes. Uh, the, the famous little triangle, the pyramid that says, you know, basically, if you don't have food and shelter and things like that, then you're not likely to be writing the great American novel because you're too worried about finding food and shelter. Uh, and I think COVID has sent a lot of us back on, the, you know, well, are we going to find food and shelter? What happens if we get sick? You know, should I be writing now? Um, but I think the basic, you know, the basic idea is you got to keep doing it. Um, I know a lot of people in the uh, 20 books to 50K group are, are saying, you know, that, that the one thing you want to do is just keep moving forward. Put a word down, follow it by another word, mm -hmm. and another word. And after a while, you got a story. So I think that's probably the easiest way to deal with writer's block. There are times, though, when writer's block is actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, at least once, I've had a writer's block where it turned out I had forgotten something uh, that had occurred earlier. Uh, and I was blocked because I had remembered that I had to deal with that issue in order to move forward. So it can occasionally be your own brain saying, hey, there's something you missed and you haven't figured it out yet. Uh, but if you're seriously blocked, then I would recommend doing some other exercises, maybe writing poetry, uh, maybe changing styles, go out for a walk and dictate, um, just to see if you can come at it or even start a different story. Uh, although I rarely suggest that, but if you're really seriously blocked, that may be the right thing to do. So that's my suggestions. How about you, Kevin? Well, and I, I think I want to reiterate what, what Todd said is a really interesting thing to start with that let, let's just begin by laying it out there that, that COVID changed all the rules so that all my ranting stuff that I would say at any other writing, writing conference, it, it's different now because never before have we worried that society was going to fall before we got the book done. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and that's not really that much of a joke. I mean, there were, there were times where you just went, holy crap, this, what two years from now, what is this going to look like? So that, that's a paralyzing thing that just is, let's just kind of, let's set the end of the world aside for now so we can talk about writing. <laughs> right, um, yeah. exactly. But, but uh, I, I really, I, I'm kind of a hard liner on this because I think a lot of a lot of uh, writer's block is is BS. I think a lot of it is people making excuses. Um, I think it's like, well, no, I really do want to play World of Warcraft. I don't want to write a chapter, so I'm writer's block. Um, mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that um, I really try to emphasize is if you have a professional mindset, if, if writing is your job, if you're trying to write a book to make money, or if that's how, how you're trying to get things done is you need to write a book, that is your job and you need to go in and do your job even if you're not really that happy about going into work to do your job. Yep. Doctors don't get doctor's block. Teachers don't get teacher's block. Lawyers don't get lawyer's block. Yeah. So writers, you do your job. Even if you don't think it's any good, you still write your pages. And right. I've had many times when I've had uh, and I mean, I have an outline for a book and I have a book deadline and I've got to write two chapters a day. And, and I've had times when I had the flu or I had a hangover or I just, I just didn't feel good. I didn't want to write. And I just went, sorry, I've got to write 
a chapter and I would go out and it was like pulling teeth, but I had to write my sentences. I had to write my chapters and it was awful. But you know what? When I reread it, when I'm editing the book, that chapter seemed just as good as any other chapter that was in there because we, we are, we, I mean, so yeah. it's, we, we have an innate talent. Uh, I mean, I I'm, I'm, hope I'm speaking for everybody that if you're a writer, you've got a talent as a writer and your, your skill level comes through. And in fact, that's one of the, the reasons why I like outlining because I've already, I've done the creative part during, well, a lot of the creative part during the writing of the outline. And so when I have an outline for chapter five, when it talks about these characters go to this place, they meet at the tavern and they have a conversation and then they go off and jump on their horses and go to fight the dragon. Well, I've got that outline down. So I, I write that chapter and I put it out there. And one thing that really struck me is I remember a panel a long time ago at a Worldcom, and I was on a panel uh, with Jerry Purnell, um, big, big, uh, big, loud and talented Jerry Purnell, who was a who was a pretty fast writer, and he was also on the panel with Octavia Butler, who was a very literary writer. Uh, she won a whole bunch of I think a couple of Nebulas or Hugos, and she and she was her. sort of a slow academic literary writer. And uh, and somebody in the audience asked That's about writer's block. And Jerry Purnell in his loud voice goes, ah, there's no such thing as writer's block. I don't believe in writer's block. And Octavia Butler just said, well, but what do you do? How do you get over writer's block? And Jerry Purnell said, well, you write one sentence, then you write the next sentence, then you write another sentence. And when you got a page done, then you write another page and there's no more writer's block. Hmm. And Octavia Butler says, but what if it's not any good? And Jerry said, well, then you fix it. <laughs> and that's, that's how you get over writer's block. I wish I was there for that. Yeah. But I mean, I, I, to get back to what, what, what Todd had brought up, it's, if you're really worried about what's going on in the world right now, if there's, if there's um, looters and demonstrators and people dying of COVID and all this, it's not just like, don't be such a pansy and go off and write your chapters. I mean, this is serious stuff. Is. So the rules are changed. So I'm not going to be that much of an, an uh, an ogre about this, but I mean, you can see behind me, Yet Yeti's really concerned about the world right now. I, I see um, it on his face. That, I keep, now like, that's keeps like changing positions. He's so cute. Yep. All so, right, that's my answer. That's, you know, it's, so since I, I went blind three years ago and then- It was overnight too. And it was overnight, I went blind overnight. So I, I went to sleep and I could see and I woke up and I couldn't see. And I was with Todd and Brianna and we were supposed to write that morning. Uh, and we all went to a coffee shop and we were going to write. And I'm like, hey, you know, the, the lights are just, we realized I was going blind. We all had to rush to the, the hospital and everything else. And ever since then, um, my whole perspective on writing has changed because it's really, my whole world is an inner dialogue, which is very similar to, to writing. But it, there's a point, it is with writer's block. What do you do in writer's block when you're facing great adversity? Like, is it writer's block or is it just an incredible amount of stress? What do you do? And if it's your job, and I think it's just the best that you can. Um, and Todd and Brianna always tell me this, like, they said, you're just doing the best you can. I'm like, well, I've written two pages this week, right? Fine. And I'm a professional writer. Like, well, you're doing the best you can. Uh, and I think that's, I think in this climate, it's pretty much the best that you can do. I, I, and, and we've had conversations. She was in the hospital. And, I, and she says, I haven't written anything in weeks. I said, You've been in the hospital. You can't write anything if you're dead. Now, uh, listen, listen, <laughs> listen, and I take out a piece of paper, right? I said, listen, take out my pen. So, all right, just because we can't write right now because you're literally in a hospital doesn't mean we can't create, doesn't mean we can't dream. Sometimes doing the best you can is one word, two words, three words. It doesn't matter. Just do something or lay out. Yeah, just do something. Even, and I noticed for me that creativity like a muscle needs to be stretched out first. So sometimes I do some really bad stick figure drawings. I'm wanting to start, uh, my dream is I want to do illustration now. So I've been doing some really bad paintings. They're actually really good. Oh, thank you. I've been doing some apparently not so bad paintings. <laughs> Says the blind girl. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I've got 10% in my left eye. Sometimes on it, right eye. Yeah. Sorry, and it moves more. around. You know what? You take the compliments where you can get All them, right? right? You, you know what? You got to make the ego feel good when you can. The but blind that, that was, girl that was, likes your paintings. You, you know what? That yep. was an excellent that, that bird. That was good. 
Yeah, I like that. That's pretty cool. The blind girl like, oh, likes you look great. They're like, you can't. What? <laughs> so, I, what were you saying, Todd? Brit, we were talking over you over here. <laughs> who were we talking? Oh, you didn't hear me? No, no, we were. We were. You were talking over me. How rude! Okay, I said the blind girl likes your paintings. <laughs> I like your paintings too, Todd. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so we don't have a lot of time left. I think we have how much time? I think we've got like ten minutes. And we need to get to, I think we should talk about publishing, publishing, and yeah. then, um, yeah, and, and also talking about, you know, selling your work into TV and film. But I, there was something that we kind of came across about was really powerful, is that, you know, each year, they, we're doing essentially the same panel, but with different people, and it's, it's in the different ways, and we're in this very interesting time. So talking about that, where we are right now with COVID, the inability to leave the house, the fear of getting ill, particularly when you're high risk like us. And uh, I think keeping that in mind is a, is a pretty powerful thing. Um, Todd, would you like to start? What am I talking, talking about? about? Uh, talking about publishing. Let's start with publishing. Okay, well, I think, um, I, I think we're all hybrid publishers here. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, a hybrid author. A hybrid author is somebody who's published with the main, with the, with the big houses and also a self-published. I think there's a huge movement more towards self-publishing and it's easier every day. You have uh, places like draft to digital where you can just put your work up and it'll take a word document and turn out a, an ebook for you. Uh, you can do stuff with Amazon. It's, it's really pretty amazing how easy it is to get published. The, the next problem of course is you have to get people to find you and that's a whole different kettle of fish. Uh, and it's one of the things we're all working on. Uh, I think we mentioned it once already. There's a group called 20 Books to 50K, uh, and they do an annual uh, meeting actually in Las Vegas. Uh, they've got some really good stuff going uh, and a lot of ideas on how to, to move your publishing forward. Um, I think today in the publishing world, if you really want to have your book published, there's nothing stopping you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important to remember. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Rebecca? Um, just to add to that, there's nothing stopping you from getting published, but um, if you want to bring people to read your work, make sure it's worth reading. So make sure you've actually published it in a readable format and uh, that you've had it edited by someone other than yourself um, and make it a good enough quality so that anybody who discovers your work and comes to it we'll come back to it again. But I'll let Kevin say the professional publisher and the other stuff because same thing. Okay, uh, well, one of, the, one of the things that has changed so much is that when, when we all started out, um, you would send your manuscript to an agent who would then sell it to an editor in New York who would then publish the book and they would do all the work and they'd edit it for you and they'd do the cover design and they'd print it and they'd get it sent out to all the big bookstores and you just sat back and wrote the next book. And I just have to say that those really were the good old days, and I, I, I liked that. Although there are tons of opportunities now that you didn't have before. But in order to take advantage of those opportunities, you can't just be a writer. You have to be a full-on entrepreneur. You need to know every aspect of the business, not just, I wrote a good story and sent it somewhere. You've got to learn... Uh, editing, book design, or, or know somebody who does, and cover design, or know somebody who does. And then, um, yes, any of you can publish your book. It's a piece of cake to publish your book. To get more than your mom to read it, that's the next question. I mean, you, it's a whole different thing for you to understand all of it. And I, I, I think for Rebecca and me, way more, well, half, half or way more than half of our time is not spent writing. It's spent doing all the other peripheral stuff involved in it. And, and I guess this is, this is the time I'll throw in my little plug because uh, among one of the other things that I have to do or that I enjoy doing is, is I'm a professor teaching a master's degree in publishing for Western Colorado University. And I'm running the department. Uh, last year, we filled up our cohort. This year, we, we've only got two slots left, but the classes start really soon. But I should point I, out that one of the reasons you're teaching publishing is you've been a publisher for a while. Right. So I, I mean, we have a program that is, that is really balanced between traditional publishing 
and indie publishing. In fact, it's, it's literally half of the credits are indie publishing and half the credits are traditional publishing. And I've been very successful in traditional publishing. I've got um, 56 national or international bestsellers. I've got 23 million copies in print. So I did that right. But that part of the industry has really changed. And now Rebecca and I uh, formed Wordfire Press. We've now got 350 titles published, 100 authors. Um, some do really great. Some don't do much. A lot of it depends on whether the authors really promote or not. And a lot of it depends on what phase of the moon it is. I mean, there's so many different things. Uh, and so I, I guess I'll just most of us have learned by doing, or we listen to podcasts, or we read Publishers Weekly, or, or we talk to our friends, and, and did you know that this changed on Amazon, or did you know that draft to digital offers this new thing, and, and if that's what you like, how you like to learn is just by, by osmosis and picking everything up, that's great, but um, one of the reasons that I'm, I'm enjoying teaching this publishing master's degree is a lot of people kind of want to have the more structured academic, we're going to learn this this week and this next week and this so that by the end, it's a one year program. And so by the end of the year, you've covered really a lot of the bases and for the students that they, they edit an anthology that they, they pay professional rates for, they have to work with the authors, they write the rejections, they write the contracts, they copy edit the stories, they, they design the cover and then they release it. And the our very first one, the book that we just published or that's coming out in a couple of weeks, uh, got a starred featured review in Publishers Weekly. So, so the kids did a pretty good job, I think. So um, anyway, what, Western Colorado University Publishing, that uh, if you know how to use the Google, you can probably figure that one out. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. I wish when we started, I, I wish that, yeah, yeah, that was available because you would have had two Well, you're almost old enough to be college students now, so you could maybe... It's true. <laughs> Almost. Almost. Oh, that, that's funny. That's it. There's some, there's been, it's some good thing. I think there. everyone I went to school with is now in grad school. They just graduated college like last year. Yeah. So yeah. 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 That's a trip. That's true. So we have uh, about two more minutes. Uh, I, I want to say one thing real fast. Um, if I were talking about publishing, what I would research is Amazon. Um, everything they do with Amazon promotion. Um, I would just go take as research and read as many books and watch as many YouTube videos and master selling on Amazon. So we have now one more minute, but this is the problem with this panel every year, which is we have so much information and only so much time. But if there is a brief note on selling into TV and film, what Britt and I always say is focus on publishing first. Also make sure to have everything copywritten and get a good lawyer and everyone and make sure the uh, the money is always coming to you and if someone says oh you pay me and something yeah i think todd you said that better than me could you yeah the money's supposed to flow to the author and i think talking about film and tv probably kevin's the best guy to get an answer seeing as he's got the whole dune thing going on yeah but all that took 20 some years to happen and and who knows how if it's reproducible what i could say so i i would th i would suggest Focus on the publishing because you actually can do that and you can influence that. And, and I think film with people who have succeeded in the area. Yeah, I, I think film and TV so much is capricious and so much is hot air and yeah. so much is imaginary that don't pin your hopes on it. It's great when it happens. But I think for uh, if you're aspiring, you should really write your book, write your short stories and, and start building an audience and start getting good at telling stories. Because whether it's book publishing or whether it's film or TV, it's got to have a good story behind it. Uh, especially Absolutely. In when the entire, when Hollywood was basically shut down, right? Uh, I think this is right. really, what, what I wanted to talk about with this panel was mostly writing this time um, because of that. Because right. there is no filming, there, there's no meetings, there's nothing. We couldn't take a meeting in Hollywood that we would have, so we have to push back so many meetings just Everything. because of it. Everything. So, so we can't film, and then even that, we, we have questions. Second wave, this, and that, you never really know what's going to happen. And that's the one thing with Hollywood: things get delayed. But with writing, it's something you always have control of. <laughs> oh, kitty cat! Uh, so if you have any questions on uh, any more, just Rian and I are under Winter Twins on on social media on the everything on the everything's. Uh, uh, we will learn TikTok one day. 
Um, oh, yes. So, we'll and, and you can ask us there. Um, where can we find the rest of the panel? We're going to start with Todd. Where can we find your books? I believe that when this is posted, we're going to have links to you guys, too. Okay. Awesome. Now, well, you can find me at uh, toddmccaffrey.org or on Instagram at Todd underscore McCaffrey, M-C-C-A-F-F-R-E-Y. All right. How about you, Rebecca? Um, I'm at Rebecca Mesta on um, Twitter and Facebook, but I don't post a lot. Okay. Um, I kind of respond to people, but I don't post a lot of my own. Um, but our website is wordfire, W-O-R-D-F-I-R-E dot com. Okay. And wordfirepress.com. That's our publishing right. house. So you can see all the books that we published and, and that sort of stuff. And uh, uh, look up official Kevin J. Anderson on Facebook. And I'm uh, my KJ. initials at, at the KJA on Twitter. And all kinds of other stuff. In fact, the if you go to wordfire.com, you can sign up for our readers group and we give you a bunch of free books and free photos and cat pictures and all kinds of fun stuff. So And that's a great thing because reading is how you become a good writer. Read until your eyeballs fall out. Yes, but yeah, Todd. Or your ears fall off if you're listening. Yep. Yes. All right. Well, thank you guys. Big virtual right. hugs. For virtual hugs. Thank you. Virtual yeah. hugs. We will see you all next year at Comic Con and give you all non virtual hugs. Yes, we will. be healthy, everyone. All right, and, okay. we, and now the twins figure out aha, okay, okay bye for real from your technology. <laughs> all right. <laughs>